Welcome to the Knowledge for Men show. Your life will never be the same. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I want to die empty of regret. I want to die empty of my best work. We don't understand who we are. Instead, we're living out somebody else's narrative. What one man can do, another man can do. If it's been done, it can be done again. Being yourself and being your truest, most authentic self in every moment. If it scares you or makes you a little afraid, do it. Follow your heart and your gut. The first stage. I think it's finding you, like finding out who I am today. Stuff will not work. You will have things that fail. Success is when you're a happy, fulfilled person. How do you define success? It's your life and you are the creator of the movie script that is your life story. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with William McRaven. He's a former U.S. Navy admiral and served as the ninth commander of the United States Special Operations Command from August 2011 to August 2014. He helped devise the strategy for how to bring down the Osama bin Laden and commanded the courageous U.S. military unit that carried it out in May 2011, ending one of the greatest manhunts in history. He's also the author of a book you guys absolutely need to check out called Make Your Bed, Little Things That can change your life and maybe the world. Bill, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Great to be here. All right. And Bill, we start off every show with a favorite success quote or some sort of saying that the guest has lived by that's helped them on their journey. So what do you got for us and how has it helped you? Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, you know, I think friends, uh, folks might be surprised to know that I actually like poetry. I've tried to hide that from my my SEAL friends, but, uh, <laughs> but I do like poetry. And okay. my favorite one is, is If by Rudyard Kipling. You know, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. And uh, it's just a a great poem and, uh, frankly, great words to live by. Yeah. And so that quote, for those who haven't checked it out listening right now, just you go to Google, type in if, and then Rudyard Kipling. It's it's a very powerful quote about basically what it means to be a strong man. So what is it about that quote? that really has helped you on your journey and and quite the career here that you've, you've shared that I just shared in the intro. Well, you know, my mother gave me this book years ago, The 101 Famous Poems, and If was one of her favorite poems, so she kind of had me memorize it. And it's not just a single, you know, line within the poem. It's everything about it. You know, it talks about, you know, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, you know, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. I mean, it is a great framework for, frankly, how to be a man. And of course, the final part of the quote is, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, and I was a miler in high school, so somehow that resonated with me, it says yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. So a, a great poem for of course, not just men, for anybody. Yeah. Great advice by Rudyard Kipling. Yeah. Do you have any any thoughts on just the state of man? Like, where are men today? Well, you know, I've been fortunate in my Navy career is that uh, I was surrounded predominantly by men. And most of those guys that I went through SEAL training with and that I served with in the military really had a, you know, a code of honor. They had a, a work ethic that I thought was important. They understood the, the value of duty and service and country. And so I was fortunate to spend 37 years, you know, around men like that. But frankly, again, the women I served with, I think, had the same sense of of duty and country uh, as the men did. That was kind of later in my career, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I'm looking at the intro that I just gave for you, and when when I say that, it looks like almost 40 years, about 37 years in the in the military and you've served at some of the highest ranks i i believe in in the navy and having gone through many it looks like a, a lot of the ranks through the special forces community in the navy does any of that just strike you do you ever just look back and go wow i did that like i was a part of really a part of history for the special forces community well i'll tell you andrew i was very lucky you know when i started off back in 1977 you know i went to the university of texas on an ROTC scholarship. I graduated in 1977 and I went immediately into SEAL training. But hard to believe that back in 1977, nobody knew who the SEALs were. In fact, it was an Army Green Beret that my sister was dating that kind of led me in the direction of being a Navy SEAL. And so I went to SEAL training out in Coronado, California. And I tell folks, I, I think there were kind of four phases of my life going through the Navy. And, and the first one was, you know, I, I went to SEAL training because it was a challenge. You know, a lot of when you a lot of ask a lot of people and you say, you know, why did you join the military? You know, a lot of them will say, I wanted to serve my country. And clearly I wanted to serve my country. But candidly, at 21 years old, I was looking for that physical challenge. And uh, BUDS, as we referred to it, basic underwater demolition seal training, really, 
really gave me that challenge. And then the challenge became an adventure. You know, you were uh, once you got into the SEAL teams, you were jumping out of airplanes, you were locking out of submarines, you were traveling all around the world, you were blowing things up. You know, you were having a right. a good time. And then about 15 years into my career, I realized that it had become a profession. I now, about in my 15th year, had command of a SEAL team, SEAL Team Three. You realize that for the past 15 years, you had learned, you know, your trade, and your trade was combat, and your trade was being a Navy SEAL. And so all of a sudden it becomes a profession. And then really after 9-11, it became a calling. You really were doing something that was important for the nation. And the men and women that worked with you and for you really had that same sense of calling. So, you know, it, it's been a great journey. But I can tell you, you know, I never looked too far over the horizon. I mean, it really was about, you know, what am I doing today? Let me do the very best I can today and, and tomorrow will take care of itself. I see a lot of uh, you know young men today that their event horizon is way out there. They they start at uh, at a young age of 22 and they say, well, where do I want to be when I'm 40 or 50? Right. I guarantee you, I never looked at that. I mean, I I really did kind of take it day by day. And you're right. When I look back and I say, well, it was a it was a hell of a career and a great life. But at the time, it was just what I did. And so it's easy to look back at it in in retrospect. But when you're in the middle of it, it's just what you do. Yeah, I, that's really interesting. I, I think you're absolutely right that we do look too far to the future and, and try and vision out, okay, where do I want to be? And then we're sad that we're not there and we're kind of, we won't be happy until the future. But it sounds like in your career, you were, it sounds like you're present. It sounds like you're you're, you're doing what you had to do and, and having fun in the moment and doing each day, day in, day out in the Navy. That's exactly right. I mean, you had to do the very best you could do at the job you had at the time. And again, if you start focusing on the next job, then you're probably not going to do the one you're in very well. And then over time, they just all kind of added up. But I guarantee you, as you can well appreciate, you know, life has its twists and turns. And anybody that thinks they can plan out their life <laughs> probably isn't very old. Right, right. So when you made that shift from being a, a SEAL and then going to commanding SEAL Team 3, did did you feel ready? Did it did someone just appoint you and you're whoa, I no, wasn't absolutely. I wasn't ready for that or did you feel Oh yes? no, I was ready for it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, by that time I had spent 15 years being a Navy SEAL. And so and in typical military fashion, every step of the way they are training you, you know, kind of for the next step. You know, I mean they're they're going to teach you how to be an assistant platoon commander, then how to be a platoon commander, then how to be a task force commander, then how to be an executive officer and all that leads you to be in a commanding officer of a team. And that was when I was uh, an 05, a Navy commander, like a lieutenant colonel. And so, yes, everything the Navy had done uh, postured me for that that time and that place. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about after 9-11? You said it became a calling. Did any part of you feel like, wow, like a lot of what I have done in the past has led down to this moment right here where I get to actually use all, all of my skills in a and what became a very long-standing conflict. Yeah, you know, a lot of my friends and my colleagues retired about the time they made Navy captain. I was very, very fortunate, lucky in many respects, to go on and become a Navy admiral, which allowed my career to be extended. So as as 9-11 happened, by that time I had 26 years in the Navy. And had I not made admiral, I would have retired like a lot of my colleagues and, and have had a wonderful career. But 9-11 happened. I made flag officer and I immediately went back into the fray. I spent two years in the White House. I'd come off a, a, a bad parachute accident in 2001, got fixed and got well. And uh, I went to the, the White House in 2001, spent two years there. And uh, then two, by 2003, I'm back in at a special operations command and then headed over to, to Iraq. And, and really, for the most part of uh, the next uh, uh, three years, certainly on and off, I was in Iraq and Afghanistan. Then after that, I was the commander of Special Operations Command Europe and the NATO Special Operations guys. That was in Germany, but I bounced back and forth between Iraq and Afghanistan a little bit. And then right after that was over, I spent another three years as the commander of a special operations unit in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, yeah, and, and I did definitely feel that everything in my career up to that 26-year mark had set me up for success uh, when when the call to combat came. Yeah, and just... 
again, back to that main, your, your point where you were just focusing on doing what you had to do each day, not really envisioning that, hey, I'm going to be the leader of this special forces yeah. community here. You're focusing on the day in, the day out, you're present. And I think that's really important. And we're constantly seeking and, and li living for the future. How does the international community view the United States special forces? So if you're working with, let's say, the UK and, and the SAS, or you're working with France or other countries, is there a high level of respect? Is it very competitive? Yeah, well, well first, the, all the NATO nations I worked with, along with the United Arab Emirates and some of our Arab colleagues, have some great, great soldiers, great special operations soldiers. The thing that makes the United States special operations different is that we have all the command and control infrastructure to go along with the great soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines we have. So, you know, if you go to France or the UK, they have got some magnificent uh, special operations soldiers, but they don't have, you know, a predator and a reaper and an overhead surveillance and all the logistics support that we would have. So they had to essentially work with us, which we were happy to have them. And again, great soldiers, but we partnered together. And it's not that they didn't have, you know, predators from both France and the UK, for example, but they didn't have as many of them. They obviously didn't have as much air support as much aircraft carrier support and all those sort of things. So really what made us different from our NATO counterparts and others was all of the great logistics and, uh, and command and control support we had that allowed our soldiers to be really the best in the world. And our partners understood that. Has much of what you just shared been developed in the last decade from this last conflict? Well, what, is, what has developed in the last decade plus uh, has been a great relationship with our NATO counterparts. You know, for years, the U.S. Special Operations Forces, you know, back in the 70s and the 80s, the Europeans really had a leg up on us. They were just candidly better than we were. But as the Reagan buildup came in the 80s and we began to get a little bit more money, as the kind of revolution in military affairs began in the 90s, by the time 2001 came, the U.S. Special Operations Forces were really uh, hitting their stride. So all of a sudden, you know, we, we go to Afghanistan and then subsequently on to Iraq. We have built a world-class special operations force. And again, great relationships, great partnerships with our European allies and others. And that really served us well, you know, right after 9-11 all the way up to today. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we're going into the, the politics and, and even the history. I'm just always interested in, in special forces. I, I think that there's definitely a lot of public attention on special forces, uh, specifically the SEALs in the last decade. How do you feel about being a former SEAL? And there's just books. There's It seems like there's a movie almost every year about SEALs. There's even a new show on the History Channel called Six, uh, which is about SEAL Team Six. And I just read that because the show is doing so well, they've already planned on launching more seasons. And also CBS, Fox, and ABC have announced that they want to launch a special forces war drama as well. And I'm wondering... Asking someone who has seen this evolution, how does this, how do you feel about all this? Yeah, I think it might surprise a lot of folks, but it really doesn't bother me. And the reason it doesn't is one of the reasons I got into special operations was, was because of the movie, The Green Beret. <laughs> okay. So, you know, when people think about, well, the SEALs have got a corner on the market on this. Several years ago, when I was at U.S. Special Operations Command, I went down to our library and I asked the librarian, I said, can you pull all the books written by you know, special operations guys since 9-11? And she had kind of a quizzical look on her face. And she said, she turned and kind of looked at the library. She said, well, sir, these are all the books. Said, Some of these are Vietnam era, but most of them have been written since 9-11. And so every service, you know, writes books about things they've done. I mean, you have you know, the special forces guys and the special tactics guys and the rangers, they're, they're all writing books. And I'm okay with that. As long as that book kind of focuses on the bravery and the sacrifice and, and really tells the story of, you know, life as it is as a soldier and the hardships they have to endure, because that helps inspire people. Uh, when you go back and look at World War II, and I, I was a little bit of a amateur historian, I went back and read, you know, hundreds of books from World War II written by, you know, soldiers and sailors and airmen uh, and Marines. And these were great stories, again, about great heroic acts uh, that I think inspire young men and women to come into the military. So I'm all right with all this stuff, as long as it doesn't get too skewed, and as long as we're obviously not divulging classified material. And that's really where you have to draw the line is when 
Texas techniques and procedures are somehow brought out in the book that could uh, put other guys at risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Have you seen or viewed this, all the attention as basically, it sounds like free marketing, publicity, recruiting for more talent into the military? Well, what you have is, you know, anytime you have a, a movie that comes out that, you know, inspires young kids. I mean, I remember when the movie Top Gun came out, uh, it was the best recruiting tool for the Navy in terms of pilots. Every pilot wanted to come and be you know, a Top Gun pilot. So I do, I do see that these movies and these books uh, bring in, you know, great young men to our, our organizations. Now they have to make it through SEAL training and Ranger qualification and, and uh, SF qualification courses and those sorts of things. Um, but we need, you know, a lot of great, you know, SEALs and Green Berets and special tactics and Rangers. So the more these books and movies bring in and the more that we can be selective, the better we are as a military. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. And one of the points in your book, you have a number of great points, is how you say no SEAL could could make it through alone. And and that if you want if you want to get to your destination, you're gonna need good people, you're gonna need a good team around you, and that your success depends on others. And I find that coming from I mean, I'm not in it, but I would I would assume that there's you know guys who enlist in special forces would be these alpha guys, these these very athletic and men who feel like they can do it on their own, that they they don't need help. Have have you found that that type of attitude is is actually going to be unhelpful when they're going through their training and and through buds perhaps? Yeah, it takes them about five minutes when they go to buds to realize that they can't make it on their own. Okay. <laughs> And the instructors are very quick to point that out. And when we, get, when we go through SEAL training, we carry what's called an inflatable boat small, an IBS. It's a you know, rubber raft. It's, yeah, I don't know, eight, eight to 10 feet long, seven guys on the boat. So you've got two guys, one on each side, on the port and starboard side on the left, two in the middle, two in the rear, and then a, a coxswain, the officer generally at the back. And I tell the story, you know, everywhere you went in first phase, you carried that IBS with you. But you also uh, hit the surf with it. You know, you'd paddle through the surf zone. Well, if everybody wasn't paddling together, you were going to get turned sideways into the surf and, and get dumped back on the beach. If everybody, you know, didn't follow orders, if everybody didn't give way together, and you find out very quickly that I don't care how tough you are, you're not going to make it on your own. You know, you may be the most alpha male around, but to do a SEAL mission or an SF mission or a Ranger mission, you have got to have your swim buddies or your ranger buddy with you. And that's, uh, you know, and we're called the SEAL teams for a reason. Right. It's about being a teammate. And, and we all recognize that, yeah, we can't make it through life on our own. And I don't care how tough you are. And, and maybe as you get older, it becomes uh, more and more apparent. But I think early on in training, you realize if you're going to go on a tough mission, you better have a good teammate with you. I like that a lot. And I think it just, it just goes to show at the highest level in you know, at your level, you're saying that this is important. And even for SEALs as they're, as they're coming in, that it's, it's critical across the board. You share a story in the book about a man named Tom Norris, who was, you know, in, in the SEAL, you say one of the toughest SEALs in, in the history of SEALs. But when he was going through training or, or, or buds, people were saying he was too small. He was too thin. He wasn't strong enough. And he became a uh, what sounds like in your book, uh, a, a legend in the SEAL community. And the point that you are making is it's, it's really only the size of your heart that matters. Yeah. You know, again, this is something you find out very, very quickly going through SEAL training is, you know, you get up there when you're young and you're 21 years old and you're sizing everybody up around and you look at, and you see kind of these big, strong guys and you think, wow, that guy is, is really strong and powerful. He's going to make it. Yeah. You know, and he's gone by the end of the first day. And, and the kid that's, uh, you know, five foot five, who weighs about, you know, 135 pounds, all of a sudden he's the guy that becomes, you know, the class leader and ends up being the, the honor man of the class. And, you know, I mean, the story of Tommy Norris is, is very, I, I mean, I like the story because one, as you recall in, in the book, Make Your Bed, I went in to, to have a meeting with one of the officers the year before I went to SEAL training. And I didn't know who Tommy Norris was. I, I happened to see what I thought was a young dependent outside the office. And it wasn't until I got in and started talking to Lieutenant Huth. And then all of a sudden he yelled out in the hallway and Tommy Norris came in. And of course, he had, introduces him as Tommy Norris. And, and I knew the name, of course. And, and Norris was a Medal of Honor recipient, went on to be on the uh, FBI's hostage rescue team, since gotten to know Tommy quite well. He is about as humble a man as there is. 
and about as tough a man as there is. So you're right. You can't uh, you can't judge anybody other than by the size of their heart. I think that is is a is a powerful lesson for for men who you know thousands of men listening to this right now, and maybe they've been viewing other men as more stronger men or more powerful men or more successful men because of their height or their physical attributes. But what, what it comes down to, and what you're sharing in the book, is uh, is this, it's the size of your heart, and and that's something that I think we can all control. It's something that you know I think we're all equal on that footing. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's. You know, what are you made of? What are you really made of? It isn't about, again, how big and how tall and how strong and how fast you are. You know, it's how much guts do you have? You know, it's it's the size of the dog in the fight sort of thing. This really connects with your next point. You know, life's not fair. You've got to drive on. And you talk about how you deal with life's unfairness is kind of like how successful you're going to be, how, how much, you know, you're going to, how far you're going to go. And sometimes no matter how hard you try or how, how good or bad things happen, just don't complain and stand tall and just really look to the future. And uh, as you say, drive on, I'm curious, like, how do you view challenges when a challenge and a deep adversity hits you? How do you register it? And, and what is, what is going on in your mind in that situation? Well, you know, at this point in my life, I've been through a lot of adversity as I <laughs> right. think, uh, you know, most people have. So you learn how to deal with adversity. And, you know, some, some young men learn very early in life, you know, if they're, if they can't come from a broken home or, or their parent uh, dies early or, or something serious happens to them when they're young, in order to continue on, they've got to figure out how they're going to deal with that adversity. You know, I was fortunate uh, that I didn't have a lot of adversity in my life. But when I, when I got the SEAL training, of course, they force adversity on you. And it's not, you know, it's not the adversity of losing a loved one. But it is the adversity of failing. And, uh, you know, part of SEAL training, I think, is teaching you, each person going through, that you're going to fail. Uh, I don't care how good you think you are, you are going to fail. And sometimes it's very arbitrary. This is where we, in the book, I talk about, you know, sugar cookies. And the thing about the sugar cookie, I think, that was maddening to some of the students was, you know, sometimes they could do everything right. So they'd have a you know, perfect uniform. Their bed would be made just right. Everything would be right. And the instructor would still have them hit the surf, as we would say, run out, jump in the ocean and become a sugar cookie, roll around in the sand. And I remember the first week or two that I was there, there was another officer that was with me and he just couldn't deal with it. He said, wait a second, I don't understand. My brass buckle, belt buckle looked great. Why did I have to hit the surf? Why did I have to become a sugar cookie? And of course, I tried to explain to him that, look, this is just the way it was. The instructors were really just messing with you. And you've just got to get over it. But he really struggled with it, as did a lot of other students. And so part of what you learned in SEAL training was, you know, sometimes no matter how good you are, you know, you're going to be a sugar cookie. And I think life is like that as well. I talk about Moki Martin, Lieutenant Moki Martin in the book. Uh, Moki, one of my instructors who ensured that I was a sugar cookie a, a number of times. <laughs> but Moki was in a head-on bicycle accident that left him paralyzed from the waist down. And in all the years that I have known Moki, you know, he never once complained. He decided to, hey, I understand where I am. There's no point in, you know, complaining about my life situation. It's just time to move forward and make the best of it. And he did. And he's had a very successful life in spite of the fact that, you know, 35 years ago or so, he was in a, a serious bicycle accident that changed his entire life in an instant. And again, instead of whining about it, he just got over it and moved on. It really, the, that unfairness can make us stronger. I think that goes, you know, you have a point where you say failure can just make you stronger. You talk about uh, these circuses, which <laughs> which it sounds like it's forced or, or if you're not doing something right, you know, you're doing a really tough workout. I, I'm probably not giving enough justice to it, but. Well, the circus was a, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you had failed an event, you hadn't done the timed run in the appropriate time, or you were kind of last on the swim, you would find yourself in, in an additional two hours of PT where the physical training, where the instructors would just harass you unmercifully. And what you found is those guys that were able to kind of hold on and, you know, you didn't, it didn't get you every day, but, you know, once a week or so, you know, somebody would find themselves in a circus, but even once a week was enough because once you did an additional two hours of PT, in addition to the rest of the day, then the next day you woke up and you were tired and you could very quickly find yourself in a death spiral because you were just so tired, then you couldn't make the time the next day. But what you found over time is if, if you could push through the failures, 
the push through the circuses, then you did get stronger. Guys got better at doing push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups and flutter kicks because you were kind of forced to do extras uh, every day. So the point of the chapter on the circus is, yeah, you're going to fail. Uh, we're all going to fail. We've all failed. And you have to accept the fact that, you know, well, I failed. I'm going to learn from my mistakes. I'm going to be better next time. You know, hopefully these failures will make you stronger as, as you go through life. Is, is there anything that helps to tell yourself when you're going through that circus? Not, it, you know, it could be for, you know, exactly that when someone is having to do two extra hours of PT or, but just the circus, just, I think, I feel like if we, we have circuses in our own lives where we sure, have to do well, extra work, extra, extra things that we, we didn't plan for in our lives. Is there anything that you could tell yourself to mentally prepare yourself for the additional hardship? Well, I think you put it in perspective. You know, when I was going through SEAL training, the last thing I wanted to do was to spend the rest of my career on a ship. Now, God bless the ship drivers. I love them dearly, but I didn't want to be a ship driver. I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. So when I was going through training, you could always see these ships off the coast. And so for me, the motivation was, look, it's only two hours and, and the two hours will be tough and, and it'll be difficult, but it's only two hours. Uh, you know, if you get through this, then, then maybe tomorrow will be a little better. And, you know, you could look out for me, you could look out on the horizon and see those ships. And again, the best thing the Navy has is great ship drivers, but it just wasn't the career path I wanted. And I think in life, as you're going through these difficult times, you have to realize that, boy, there are a lot of other people going through a heck of a lot more difficult times than you are. I don't care who you are. Right. I don't care how bad things are. Somebody is always worse off than you are. Yeah. Yeah. One of your points is if you want to change the world, be your very best in the darkest moments. I, I think for for a lot of us in our darkest moments, we can we can fall, we can cripple, we can we can fall to the floor and 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 not persevere through those. But those darkest moments, I find, can give us the the biggest opportunity for growth and to really propel us forward in our lives. And I'm wondering, can you share a moment? When you were going through one of your darkest moments and you persevered, you had to reach deep down inside to pull yourself through something that you didn't think you uh, could handle. Yeah, uh, uh, probably a lot of them. <laughs> I mean, I can think of, as I said, I had a parachute accident in 2001. And, um, you know, prior to that parachute accident, I had been in, you know, a number of, you know, kind of near death experiences that generally happen when you're in a you know, a SEAL training environment. I had another parachute accident that I managed to get out of. I was in a, a boating accident, a helicopter uh, that I was in crashed in the water. And, you know, you're always able to kind of find a way out of it. But this time I wasn't. Severe parachute accident. The next thing I know, I'm, I'm lying on the ground, broken up pretty bad. And, you know, you begin to wonder, will I ever get back to being a SEAL? Am I going to have a career left? And this really takes into consideration a lot of the other points in the book, but, you know, you go back to, you know, you need somebody to help you paddle. Right. Well, there were a lot of people that uh, came to my aid to help me paddle, but you still have to do it on your own. You know, I, I had to, I had to work through the pain. I had to, you know, finally get up and decide I was going to stop feeling sorry for myself. Uh, you've got to fight through, you know, the rehab and the pain and get back on the right track. But I guarantee you, I could not have done that with, you know, without my wife, without my friends, without my boss. So, you know, dark moments. Yeah, you've got to dig, dig deep. And you're right. If you dig deep, you'll find it there. I think it's within all of us to rise to the occasion in dark moments. But it also helps to have uh, good friends surrounding you. Absolutely. With all, it sounds like there's been, I keep, I keep asking, has there been a failure, challenging time? You're like, oh, I got so many. You know, there's a lot of, you've done a lot. And I'm wondering in your career, how have you found balance or is there such thing as balance at your at, at the rank of admiral to be able to turn off and spend time with your loved ones? Yeah, you know, balance is is always hard. You know, you you like to think you can strike a nice uh, work life balance, but frankly, sometimes when you have important work to do, somebody in the balance equation will will suffer or will have to sacrifice. Uh, my wife was that person. You know, she took care of my three kids. You know, we moved every couple of years. She was always the one that kind of got us together and, and helped us move. She's been, you know, uh, my teammate, if you will, my swim buddy for uh, going on 39 years here. Congratulations. And so, yeah, thanks. So, 
Yeah, you know, you in order to move forward, you really do have to have, you know, somebody, I think, to help you. You're going to fail. There's no question about it. But having somebody that can kind of pick you up, dust you off, say, it's all going to be okay. And again, I was fortunate to find the right person to help me uh, get through life. Yeah. What was it? You said, did you say 39 years together? 39 years this May. (laughs) All right. Congratulations. Yeah. (laughs) What was it that what were some of the habits or things that you were doing that do you think that allowed you guys to stay together? I've read from a number of SEAL books that the, the divorce rate and relationships lasting is very, very low. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think one, you know, I learned to respect her very quickly. She was you know, incredibly hardworking, took care of the kids. And, you know, you it's just like anything else. You learn to respect, you know, somebody that you you admire. And that was part of it. I respected her. Yeah, I do respect her. I admire her. And, you know, she's my best friend. So, you know, when you kind of have those sort of things, and I was mentioning the other day, there's a, a great old movie called Shenandoah with one of the great actors, uh, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, it was probably made back in the 60s uh, sometime. But at one point in the movie, a young man comes to ask Jimmy Stewart, who's, again, set in the cowboy days, and, and Jimmy Stewart uh, owns this big ranch. And so a young man wants to ask Jimmy Stewart's daughter to marry him. So the man comes up to see Jimmy Stewart, and, and he says, uh, sir, I'd like to marry your daughter. And uh, Jimmy Stewart says, well, do you like her? And the guy says, oh, sir, I, you know, I love her. I love your daughter more than anything. He said, I didn't ask that. I asked if you liked her. And he says it again. He says, oh, sir, you know, I love your daughter. I'll do anything for you. And he says, son, I didn't ask that. I asked if you liked her. I said, you know, lo- love is important, but liking somebody, you know, having, having that sort of relationship is what's going to get you through a long marriage. And I, I think those are... Words to live by. Uh, I think that's a big point there. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And now let's build, dive into the knowledge around. I'm just going to ask you some rapid fire questions here and just kind of shorter gut level responses from yourself. So are you ready for the knowledge round? <laughs> okay, let's go. All right. And so what advice would you give to someone who is feeling really lost or unsure of, let's say, their purpose? Yeah, well, you know, I believe you, you have to find faith. One, I, I happen to be a man of, of faith. And I think it's important out there to realize that there is someone greater than you that can kind of help you through tough times. So, you know, find a, a reason to to realize you're, you're not the most important person in the universe and that there is, I mean, I, I believe that there's a God out there that uh, takes care of me, that points me in the right direction, that helps me when times are tough. And I think if you can dig deep and find that faith, then you'll get through the tough times. And again, you know, find somebody here on earth to, to help you through those tough times as well. Great. And what do you think is holding most men back from becoming stronger, grounded men today? Well, you know, all of us, particularly when you're young, you know, you do want to be that independent guy. You know, somewhere you have found a, a role model on TV or in the movies and you want to be Captain America or you want to be, you know, pick some role model. And you think that that person has been successful all by themselves because that's the way you picture them. And I go back to, you know, the movie I saw in the Green Berets. I wanted to be John Wayne. And, you know, John Wayne for my generation was that guy. He had that swag- swagger. John Wayne always won. But, you know, what you realize very quickly is not a whole lot of John Waynes in this world. And, and even the John Waynes need uh, somebody surrounding them. So I get back to, you know, find somebody to kind of help you paddle. And that's what's going to you know, make you a successful man. And, and I don't want to sound you know, too touchy-feely here, but recognize that you're not impervious, that you know, life can be very fragile. And, and one day you can be sitting on top of the mountain and the next day you're going to be on the bottom. Be humble, have respect for people, find people that can help you make it through, through life. Mm, very powerful. What is a morning ritual? <laughs> Actually, now that I'm thinking about this, <laughs> it's, it's likely the title of your book, but what is a morning <laughs> ritual that you just have to do every day and why? Well, it, and it is make your bed. And that, that probably sounds a little trite in light of the fact that, uh, that that is the name of the book. But the, but the reason I say that is because you know, I, I get up every morning and, uh, and it is a simple task. There, there's nothing hard about it. I take great pride in, in uh, making our bed. Now, sometimes my wife will help me because we've got a, a large double bed. But but if not, you know, I make the bed and, and it is a simple task. That it is my first task of the day. You have to have something. I don't care whether it's making your bed or, you know, getting up and PT and or whatever it happens to be. Find something to start your day off right. You know, for me, it just happens to be making my bed, making it with a sense of pride. And then again, you know, once that happens, then you you're ready for the next task and the next task and the next task. 
So simple thing to do, but uh, but very powerful in my opinion. <laughs> it's very simple. And coming from you know you just your rank and, and your longstanding career in the special forces community, I think we would assume, oh, he's got this crazy thing that <laughs> and it's make your bed, which is like the easiest thing, but it's something that I think we often neglect. But what have been three of your most influential books that have helped you on your journey? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, because my profession was war, Clausewitz on war has always been one on the war side. On my faith side, the Bible has, has always been by my bedside. And as I said, I'm, I'm a guy that likes poetry. And so the 101 famous poems has, has kind of been the third book as I think about the three books that really have shaped my life. <laughs> what do you, what do you think about, you said, you know, my profession is war, the, the book, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Yeah, it's a it's a little different approach, of course. You know, you have kind of an Eastern and Western philosophy. I have found Clausewitz's kind of uh, approach to mass and maneuver more like the Western way of war than uh, than Sun Tzu's, you know, a subtle again Eastern approach to to warfare. Mm -hmm. All right. And now this next question is more of a scenario for yourself. So imagine you had 60 seconds with 25 year old Bill, if you can envision where he's at personally, professionally, relationships, all that. And knowing what you now know today, <laughs> having gone through the journey, what would you tell yourself to do and not to do if you could sit down yeah. with 25 year old Bill? Yeah, that's easy. What I'd tell Bill is, look, the next you know, 25, 30 years are going to be tough. You're going to you're going to fail. You're going to be embarrassed. Things aren't going to go well. Work through it. Don't quit. N never, ever quit. Just keep moving forward and, and life will work out. Have faith. You know, recognize that I, I do believe that God is up there taking care of you. So don't quit and just uh, keep fighting hard for what you believe in. And, and again, if I could tell my 25 year old self, it was going to, it would be, you're going to have a lot of downtime you know, at times that uh, just don't go well. Just uh, work through them and keep moving. What you just shared there, w would you say some of that or would that be your philosophy on success? Yeah, I mean, success is, I think, simple. I, I don't think it's rocket science. Mm -hmm. Success is about not quitting. Now, how you define success might be a little different. If you decide you want to be a billionaire and you only end up as a thousandaire, well, then, I, then maybe you're not successful. But that money doesn't make you successful in life. What makes you successful in life is, is having friends yeah, having a great family, doing what you're passionate about doing. You know, if I don't wanted to make money, I would never have gone into the military, you know, but but I don't regret a single second of my time in the military because I was doing what I love to do with with folks. I, I was honored to do it with, you know, with a woman that uh, you know shared the journey with me. Wow. I'm just letting that sink in for myself and the audience that that was very powerful. I'm wondering, Bill, now what is life like now after the military? It's, it seems, what has it been three, three years retired now? Yeah, a little, you know, two and a half years retired. It'll be three years this uh, September. Yeah, it's been a great transition. Uh, you know, I'm the chancellor of the University of Texas system. So we have 14 institution, about 220,000 students, 100,000 employees. So but but I think I surprise people when I tell them the transition has uh, gone very smoothly. I'm used to running large organizations. Mm -hmm. It really is about learning to respect the people that work for you. So I have, you know, quote unquote, subordinate commanders, if you will, much like I did in the military. These are presidents of the institutions. I've got some magnificent presidents that run our, our universities and our health related institutions. I love spending time with the faculty and the staff. You know, the faculty are often kind of maligned, and uh, but I will tell you, the faculty work hard to take care of these great students, and the students are magnificent. You know, they, contrary to, again, how they are sometimes portrayed, I love the millennials. <laughs> I think I think they're <laughs> terrific, and I, I love spending time with the students. Is the UT system the largest, one of the largest employers in Texas? Oh, it is. Well, I, I don't know the exact statistic, but with 100,000 employees, it's definitely one of the largest em employers. Are you looking to implement any sort of boot camps before they get it in order to become a student? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think we'll forego that one. Okay. <laughs> and okay, and why why stay stay working? It seems like there could be a demanding position. You, you've you've done 37 years in the military, retired. Is it just something that you want to do? You can tell your Texans at heart. So, what is it? Well, why? it's about service. Okay. I've enjoyed. Again, the, the two plus years that I've been here, when you have an opportunity to see, you know, a young man or woman that's going to college for the first time, 
and you realize they are about to change the entire trajectory of their family for generations to come. Mm -hmm. Because statistics show if you go to college, you're probably going to send your kids to college. And also what statistics show is that there is nothing better for, you know, your ability to make money, but your quality of life, your health, your happiness, it all statistically gets better if you, you know, have a, a bachelor's degree. And it gets better and better as you get more education. Education buys down, you know, bigotry and racism, and it gives you a sense of other cultures. So, you know, it's having an opportunity to be around these, you know, not just young men and women, but, you know, older men and women, too, that are going back to school that, uh, that want to learn. You know, it's great to be in the service of the state of Texas. Abs- yeah, absolutely. I love the uh, just you want to serve and, and help others and, and contribute. And do you ever, <laughs> this is more personal, I guess, do, I mean, because you had such a high rank in the military, do you ever get calls from, from military or government and they ask you questions about how, how you would do things or is it just you retired and, nah. you're, and you're done? Yeah, you know, they've got plenty of great officers. Yeah. Uh, they, <laughs> they certainly don't need any input from this old retired guy. <laughs> just like, hey, Bill, we have something going on here. Want to get your input? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> They don't do that. They've got, uh, again, magnificent officers and enlisted guys. They got, they've got plenty of talent out there. All right. Just, just a personal uh, kind of joke there. And for the audience, a couple things. And then if you have anything here too, Bill, uh, please, please share. But the speech on YouTube, is it 2014 commencement speech? Right. University of Texas. It's a phenomenal speech. I think I've listened, I've downloaded it. I've listened to it over a dozen times and it's, it just, just hits home and, and it helps me get through a lot of challenging times and helps me uh, continue to put out this content for you guys. Uh, and then also the, the book, Make Your Bed, which is, seems like an extension of this speech. Is that, is that where the, the book came from? Is, is the well, speech went viral? I, I, yeah, what happened is, uh, you know, I have somebody stop me literally every day probably multiple times a day to tell me they can't, they make their bed or they don't ring the bell or they didn't back down from the sharks. But there's always a follow on piece of this. They always ask me, you know, who was it that inspired you? Yeah. And so this book is a little bit of the backstory on each of the 10 lessons on, you know, why I make my bed. And again, the story of Mookie Martin and, and Tommy Norris and others. So again, a little bit of the backstories on each of the, uh, the 10 lessons from the speech. And also I'd recommend the audio book as well. Bill actually did his own audio book, which I really like when the author does that. And it, Bill, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Are you working on any upcoming projects or websites that you'd like to share? No, really, Andrew. First, thanks uh, for taking the time to to uh, interview me today. I enjoyed this. Uh, I certainly, you know, hope that, that knowledge for men really continues to showcase, you know, what what being a man is all about. And I, I think that is important. You know, I think it gets tougher and tougher every day to be the kind of quality individual we hope all to be. You know, I mean, we we want to be men that are respected. We want to be men that treat other people with respect. And so any opportunity to kind of showcase that is important. So thanks for the work you're doing. Uh, Bill, the pleasure is is all mine. It's it's an honor to be here with you and to have the opportunity to, to listen to your story and, and pull out some incredible life-changing lessons here for my community. So thank you for your time. My pleasure, Andrew. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast. Hundreds of interviews and millions of downloads later, we're continuing to build an international movement and we're just getting started. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a helpful review in iTunes because it really helps the podcast grow so we can impact even more men in the world who need this. Guys, this is all about living with purpose, where every day you only do things that matter to you. You wake up, live with purpose, and take massive action towards the life you want. And always remember, love the life you have while creating the life of your dreams. Go to kfmfree.com to get a surprise bonus I've made for my listeners. Again, that's kfmfree.com for something that's changed my life, and I'm offering it to you for free. Also, check out my Amazon best-selling books that I've written for you to help you crush life at kfmauthor.com. Again, that's kfmauthor.com to see all the books I've created to help you break through in life. This is your host, Andrew Farabee, founder of knowledgeformen.com, and I'll see you in the next episode.